Welcome to episode number six of the Road to Cinema podcast, featuring the cinematographer behind the Sundance hit Escape from Tomorrow, Lucas Lee Graham. We discuss the making of that guerrilla style film, which was shot secretly on location at Disney World in Orlando, Florida, and Disneyland in Anaheim, California. We also discuss his experience as a cinematography grad student at AFI, the American Film Institute. To learn more about the Road to Cinema podcast, to read the Road to Cinema blog, and to watch our Road to Cinema YouTube series, please visit jogroadproductions.com. For the latest updates, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, at jogroad. And now we join cinematographer Lucas Lee Graham as he discusses his experience as a grad student at AFI, the American Film Institute. Columbia College and also to AFI, I guess, for grad school? Is that right? Yeah, okay. so I did... Um, God, I graduated from Columbia College in 2006 and then immediately started AFI. So I had to go the summer at Columbia College. <laughs> so I had like no break. So immediately into AFI for two and a half years to get my um, Were you studying uh, cinematography at Columbia as well? I was, but it's not as like formal or regimented. It's yeah. kind of like a film production degree and then you kind of focus on certain little things. And I actually don't... I'm not entirely sure I got through the cinematography concentration because mm-hmm. yeah. it's there's like a, almost like a fifth year of shooting a lot of films like practicums and all this other stuff and I just was ready to get out of there so yeah. and I was already in grad school so <laughs> I didn't care. so I'm not entirely sure that I even have the cinematography concentration there. Uh, but uh, so what I've heard AFI is kind of a pretty rigorous uh, program that they have in terms I guess yeah. like there's like teams that you set up to do films with and there's like a big judging process they do yeah like, with each round uh, I don't know if could you explain yeah. how that I mean rigorous is like a nice way to put it <laughs> <laughs> it's brutal um, so basically your first year you have to make three cycle films which is what the way you described it where it's a producing fellow, a screenwriting fellow, a directing fellow, a cinematography editor, like yeah. from each major. And you have to do three films like that. And then cinematographers have to do a fourth film on their own, which most of us partner with some of the directing people or producing people yeah. to create that, but it's not reg- like regimented through the school, so you have a little more freedom. But yeah, so. If you're in cinematography, the way it, it goes is you have class Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then you have to work on these films Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Because when you're not shooting, you're the crew for the other people, yeah. for the other cinematographers. So after like eight weeks of not having a day off, you start to lose <laughs> your mind a little. And, you know, and I, you know, you get the week off, not from classes, but from crewing before your film goes. So you have, yeah. you're in pre-production, so it's not really off. And you're, like, loading trucks. and So you do that for, like, these eight-week runs. And then they're like, oh, well, now it's break time. So then they just load you up on your classes. Mm-hmm. And then you go to the second cycle. Yeah. And so that's kind of like the physical abuse (laughs) so you're entirely exhausted all the time and then there's like this mental abuse aspect (laughs) where uh, the first thing you have to do is get in front of everybody and you critique the film in what's called narrative workshop oh the students critique the other yeah well students can critique but you also have it's run by uh, Frank I can't remember his last name. Well, he he, he actually passed away recently. Frank Pearson? Frank Pearson. Yeah, that's yeah. screenwriter. So he wrote Dog Day Afternoon. He won the Academy Award for yeah. And was head of the Academy for a long time. So he runs that. And so they just kind of rip into the film, like, brutally. And tear it apart. And then the classmates kind of join in, too. And then, yeah. So, the, and then cinematographers have to go through a class with Bill Dill. Yeah. Where it's pretty much the same exact thing. Except he specifically goes through like almost every shot of the movie, mm. and it's just like a laser pointed like bullseye at the cinematographers. <laughs> and then, does that help you in a sense? It because does. You be extra critical and really understand the nuts and bolts yeah, of everything. It does. It does. It makes you a. It toughens you up. 
Because yeah. you and then you get the kids who that are like, and I was one of these who's like, I don't care what they think. I'm an artist. I do what I want. But the thing is, you really care, you know, because someone you admire is just tearing into you. Um, but it toughens you up a little for what comes with like critics later yeah. and weird internet people that are just <laughs> like, I hate you no matter what. Mm. But, uh, beyond evil things they say, and so it does that, and it mechanically makes you a much better filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, Didn't really they shoot on film out. at AFI for the most part, right? Or is it? Uh... I mean, I was in 2008. I graduated. Yeah. And so at that time, probably half the thesis films the next year were shot on film. Yeah. So none of the first years are. Um, and I don't have a clue what they do now. Mm-hmm. So uh, technology's changed so much. Yeah. I imagine there's a couple that shoot film, but I can't imagine that's the bulk anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And uh, sort of working on what is what was your experience at the beginning working sort of on film and on digital and working with different types of cameras? Was it ever sort of a learning curve moving from one camera to another in terms of how you got the light and what was yeah. really necessary? Um, I'm grateful that I came up in the generation that got to shoot film mm-hmm. yeah. because the approach is different. You really have to think about what you're doing. Um, you can't just kind of wing it and light it off the monitor the yeah. way you can digital, which you can't mm-hmm. really do to digital anyways, but people tend to do it. Yeah, monitors it always are getting looks a little better. different when you look at it like, yeah. on a computer. It's never... Yeah, so monitors are getting better, so you can do more of that. But you really had to have an idea of what you wanted it to look like, and you would have to test the stock to see what the latitude would do and things like that. And so it makes you better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just a much better technician and understanding to communicate with the lab and how to print and do that. Um, on the other hand, I shot film recently for just a small piece of, a, of a feature called suburban Gothic that just premiered at Fantasia Fest. And we shot eight millimeter for part of it. Oh, wow. First very specific look. And I forget how big of a pain the ass film is sometimes, <laughs> especially like mag reloads. Yeah. I forget how much of your day is spent. Like, sitting there stressing of whether you're about to run out during the shot or that and you hear that sound when it goes through and you're like oh my god yeah. and then so you know they each have their advantages um, I still like the way film looks better uh, digital is is pretty much getting there now but I when there's like no cost issue like for my own personal photography I still just shoot film Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just like the way it looks better. But on like a lot of independent films, when you get on, do they have sort of an idea of what camera they're using for their budget to kind of yeah. fit into it? Or well, yeah, I mean, everyone's an expert now, so... <laughs> like, every producer or director or AD or the craft service guy has an opinion about mm-hmm. what the best camera is, so... Which, and to a point, you better, as a cinematographer, you better keep up on... Being able to know more than they do, yeah. as a lot of guys are like on Philip Bloom every day. <laughs> you know, you don't want a PA to out top you when it comes to the tech. So, um, you know, each I think picking a, a digital camera is a lot like picking a film stock. Yeah, they have a different look. There's an advantage here or there. Sometimes budget determines it yeah. more times than not, probably in indie. Uh, so I was gonna uh, sort of go into Escape from Tomorrow, uh, okay. which is a very you know unique film, unique production process. Very unique. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Uh, so how did you you know get onto that project? Did you was it producer director? I didn't know anyone. I just kind of applied for it on the internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was uh, like an open. It's like a job listing. listing. Yeah, open listing, and I had shot a film at AFI called The Eighth Samurai, which was black and white. And Randy Moore, the director of uh, Escape from Tomorrow, had already kind of made the decision to shoot black and white. Yeah. And so he liked my work in black and white. And we met at a coffee shop, and two days later we were... (laughs) It wasn't even two days, it was like the end of that day, and then the next one we were like flying to Orlando. Wow. Wow. So he had already casted the movie, he was... I don't uh, think he had casted... No. He had casted the leads maybe at that point, but... Just like mom and dad. Did he know that he wanted to shoot with a Canon 5D at that point? Yeah, I mean, that's technology is part of what made that film possible. Yeah. Because we couldn't have snuck in with anything else, really. <laughs> you know, like, the, the point was to look like a tourist. Yeah. And so that camera gave us that ability. 
And were you shocked when he told you, like, we're just going to go into Disney World and, you know, yeah. steal the location, basically? <laughs> I mean, is that how he kind yeah, of I mean, said it to you at the time? It's, <laughs> you always go through, like, these range of emotions anytime you're in pre-production. And I know, I can remember that one specifically because it's so wild. Yeah. yeah. And I knew, he had told me the budget, and it wasn't bad at that point. Um, so I knew we had some money to work with. And... We got through the meeting, and I was kind of like, yeah, whatever. Like, we're not ever going to make this movie in Disneyland. <laughs> and so I started reading the script, thinking in my mind, like, how do we find, like, an old Six Flags that's closed down or something like that? Yeah. And how much is it going to cost, and how do we cheat this? And mm -hmm. But when you, you know, you get through the script, about 30 pages in, you're like, this can't take place anywhere else. Yeah. It's written for that. And then, actually, you know, that first emotion when he told me was like, who does he know that... <laughs> Like, is he like, is his last name Eisner or something? Yeah. Like right. special yeah. Kind of shit. yeah. How is he getting this pulled off? And he didn't tell me, the only thing he told me is it has a dark undertone. He yeah. didn't tell me anything else. He's like, it's a Disney with a dark undertone. So read the script yeah. so you can. So you get into it and you're like, you can't do this anywhere else. Yeah. And then I just became so interested with the material. I was like, this, this is going to be a huge pain. <laughs> but... <laughs> I mean, I'm so fascinated with it. Like, yeah. I can't let someone else be the cinematographer of this. Like, I, yeah. I have to do this project. So, so, at a certain point, did he have a, a conception of doing, like, let's do, like, a tech scout. Like, let's go into yeah. the park and see how we can actually execute this. We scouted... I've never scouted as much on anything as we did on this. And part of that was after we read the script, I was like, how do we get away with this? And the first scout I went on with Randy was him just going through the park with us in Orlando. And we, here's this ride, here's that, let's ride this. And I think we spent four or five days in him telling him these are the ideal places. And I took a ton of photographs of where we were and compass readings. So I would, which I use later to design the film and just kind of almost like U.S. Geological Survey mapped the whole thing out. And we actually had maps where we were marking mm -hmm. stuff, and I was writing scene numbers on it. So you were trying to determine sort of what time of day the light would hit yeah. so everything would map. So that way I was knew which way it was like north, yeah. and if there was something blocking that, or what the deal was. So that was the first scout, which actually made me a little too cocky, because we got away with... I, was, I wanted to see, like, what can I get away with holding this camera? Yeah. Can I hold it like this on a ride the whole time and not get yelled at for security? I guess it's radius, so I used to say. Could I hold it above my head? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, and it, I was like, God, we can get away with anything here. Yeah. And you know, everyone has a camera at Disneyland. Everyone has a camera. People are crazy. Like, they all wear, like, the same outfits and do, like, dance scenes together. <laughs> we saw people, this couple, like, laying in front of a fountain, making out for, like, two hours. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> like, just people do crazy things there. And so... I was like, we didn't get away. And so actually, for a while, I was trying to push to like get bigger equipment in there. <laughs> I was like, we can shoot cinema lenses, you know, we don't have to use, and we'll have like a remote follow focus. And Did you guys ever, you probably didn't have like a tripod or anything in the park ever, or any We had like a couple equipment. little tripods that we would take. Really? Okay. Um, we wouldn't like shoot scenes on the tripod, though. We did those more for like B-roll and mm -hmm. stuff where... You know, it was it looked appropriate to have a tripod down. Where it was like a, we were trying to get a shot of a fountain or something like that. Yeah. Or the fireworks were all VFX heavy, mm -hmm. so we had to have tripods for those. Um, yeah. So then I went back to scout with the first AD, who is the unsung hero of the whole project because he scheduled the most impossible film to schedule mm -hmm. ever with kids and. Mm -hmm me like complaining every three seconds when we had to move a shot around because the sun wouldn't be in the right place. So what was your crew like in the park? So you had your AD, uh, yeah. you obviously DP, Randy Moore, the director. And then uh, there was a B camera operator named Justin Shell, who was also kind of our utility tech guy, yeah. who did all the DIT work too. And uh, the kids, and then the parents. So that, that was the whole... That was it. We had one PA. Yeah. 
Right. Who carried waters around because it was like Orlando. And it was miserable. Oh, wow. Did you have a lot of lenses that you brought into the park to ever switch out? Yeah, we did. There? Was that a little tricky? Uh... We, at first, we were going to shoot the film on Zeiss lenses. The, uh, I think, the ZE. I can't remember. One's Nikon, one's Canon mount. And we actually had the Nikon mount. And they're just a little easier to focus because they're manual focus in video mode. And so we started out shooting primes with those. Yeah. And like pretty quickly we switched to zooms <laughs> on Canon just because it was so, it, it was just more efficient to get like through the scenes and just be able to like pop in and zoom and shoot the close ups. So we'd only have to do everything three times without a lens change in the middle. Yeah. And then we shot on the rides, we were changing lenses more often just because we needed the speed of the yeah. fixed focal lengths. So that first day in the park that you're about to shoot, I think that was Orlando. Was that where it yeah. began? So what was that experience like? I mean, did you feel like I'm prepared? Like I can, the first, I can do this. Uh, the very first thing we shot in the park was when they're walking up to the Epcot ball. Yeah. And to that point, we had gotten away with everything we wanted, and I'd already been there for a week and a half with the AD, just going over the schedule and planning the rest of every shot out, and so I'd been in you know, in the park every day for a week and a half already. Yeah. So I was really comfortable and really happy. And then the, we did this, these shots and I think JD, the assistant director was pushing me and we had like the Zeich primes on and they're a little bigger and we we're following and big red, who was more of a major character in the script. The, oh, in the wheelchair. The wheelchair, yeah, guy. wheelchair yeah. yeah. he comes, like, cruising by us. And he has, like, a huge red wig on. <laughs> like, he looks... In black and white, he doesn't look as absurd as he does in real life. We're like, And he's got the neck brace on. <laughs> and it's like, we are drawing so much attention to ourselves. And we did it, and this Disney official came up to us. Mm. And he was just one of the photographers there at Disney and he wanted to see what camera we were shooting on and was just kind of geeking out. And so at that point I was like, okay, we need to, I need to scale us back a little. So we switched to Zing lenses. <laughs> we were running, at that point we were only running one camera so then we switched to two just in case we ever had a problem we'd have two angles. Yeah, so, so initially cut. So initially it really wasn't two cameras. Yeah, we were going to shoot single camera and two camera we had to do. Yeah. on a ride or something, but that went out within the first hour of being there. The hardest part, I thought, was just physically getting through the park. Yeah. Because you'd have something here, and we'd have, like, 15 minutes for the right light to get across a park and shoot that. And with two kids and a family, and it, it just took forever to get on foot to get back and forth. And so that was the hardest coordinate. Like coordinating part for us, for me personally. Randy, a lot of the scenes where they're talking in the park are kind of off to a side. Yeah. Um, where we have a little more control and it's where, where picnic tables were, where people eat lunch and stuff. Uh, and so that part wasn't that hard. And then the other, the camera operator, Justin Shell, him and I, we've been working together since we were 17 years old. Oh, wow. So we went to high school together. and So we have just always worked on low budget stuff. So we just use hand signals and we we have like a pretty good shorthand between the two of us. So, yeah. so it wasn't too bad. Uh, was hitting marks a little difficult for actors? Just I mean, because I know yeah. the, sometimes the 7D, the focus is a little, like if you're not like precise, sometimes things go out of yeah. focus here and there. We actually shot the 5D. Oh, the 5D. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a little harder for focus. It's still a bigger sensor. Um, we tried to shoot mid-range stops. Yeah. Like we weren't. It would have been nice to probably have that real shallow depth of field a lot, but that's just something. You know, we had to make the choice to. There, there are definitely out of focus shots in the film that I see, and I'm like, oh god. But. Um, yeah, so we would shoot around at 8 or 11 in the park for the most of the time yeah. to give us a wide depth of field, just better safe than sorry. And for the most part, I mean, did you have any, uh, were there any issues that ever came up using the 5D or were you, I mean, was it, were you pretty happy? With yeah, that? I mean, it's, it's a pretty solid system. Yeah. Um, we had one issue where we got, 
this was like Orlando, and it was, I think, I can't remember, it was either spring or fall, and all these trees were like weeping all this stuff down all mm -hmm. the time, and we got some chunk on a sensor once, and that was the only real technical problem, which was as much our fault for not being diligent, yeah. looking at that stuff. And yeah, so. Uh, so, from my understanding, you, you, uh, the camera was set to monochrome to automatically be black and white. So, I've heard yeah. like some people do black and white on a 5D, like they'll do it like color correction in post. Yeah. Uh, was there a reason why you decided to do it within the camera? Well, we knew, we had, yeah, we baked it in, which on an indie film you can get away with. You would never be able to do that on something else. Yeah. Um, and it was just a technical choice because lighting for black and white looks different than in color. So even if you shoot something in black and white on, and you record it in color, which some cameras you don't have an option, like the red works that way. There is a monochrome red, but... Um, or anything that shoots raw is going to shoot color anyways. Yeah. So I just crank the saturation on the monitors. Just because black and white likes hard light. And it looks better with higher contrast. And so we want to be able to see what the finished product was going to look like on our little tiny postage stamp screens. And also focus is easier on black and white. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did it for those two reasons. And Randy had never had any... He, there was no chance he was going to change his mind and go back to color. So, yeah. And there certainly... I mean, we made it impossible at that point, so... But... Uh, he was pretty dead set on it. So, and then uh, for some of the scenes, I guess there were uh, like I know like the end that uh, that sort of lab that Rory, that uh, Rory is in, you know, yeah. gets captured. Uh, so that was built out here. Yeah, that was at is it's either called Verdugo or Eagle Rock Studios. I can't remember. Yeah, it's 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 like on the, one of the two streets and name the other thing. <laughs> I can't remember. I always flip them. So uh, looks like a pretty elaborate set. It was. Uh, yeah, it was. I think they built it for a commercial for like a Thunderdome theme. Yeah. And so Sean actually had it, the production designer, like in his workshop. And it's just speed rail dome. So we built that and then the top half is CG, which is why it has the uh, geo disc looking things on it. And uh, yeah, and Sean built all those consoles and everything that was in it. So it was a pretty big set. And wrapped it in canvas. So I forgot about that point. Uh, for that, I guess the red was used on uh, for those scenes, mm -hmm. right? Was Everything. there a reason why the red was used for those instead of the 5D, or was that just kind of a... Yeah, so everything that's not in the park is red. Yeah. And we just did that. It looks pretty consistent, you know, from mm -hmm. one to another. Yeah, I can, for the most part, I can, I can't tell the difference. It marries together pretty well. Yeah. Um, there's a few places I can see where the the red, just because its resolution has a little higher strength in places, but um, we mostly did that for the effects, just because the 5D, and that was the Mark II, there was a, I can't remember, there's a color space issue with it, where um, it works okay. For, a back plate doesn't matter what it is yeah. in VFX, but the front plate is where they yank the green out. So we pick, yeah, that's right. This is 420 color space on the 5D. It's been years, I didn't think about it. <laughs> um, and then the red is 444. So it has a stronger green channel to pull out yeah. um, to cut those keys and mats. And a lot of the movie is, is a combination of um, in part footage with practical sets. There's I probably only sixty percent of the movie takes place actually in Disney World with full Disney World footage. Yeah. So there's a scene actually when he walks out on the balcony. And he's on the phone and he. Oh, the, is that the contemporary? Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, and he looks down, and then like a van pulls up. So inside the hotel is. Uh, actual hotel in Anaheim in, in like a room that's on like the second floor that was a set and then when he looks down we're actually on the rooftop balcony 
with like where there's like a hot tub or something <laughs> of that same hotel. Yeah. And then when the camera looks back at him, that's at the contemporary. So it's three separate locations in one scene. Yeah. So it's a lot of like yeah. combining locations to make yeah, it to match all yeah. that together. So and like knowing where the sun was to try to match that. Uh, so once you guys were in post, uh, it's kind of interesting, I guess, uh, Randy Moore decided to go to South Korea to do yeah. all of his editing, color correction, effects. Uh, so were you, were you over there? I did go. A lot of that? I went to do, we actually s- struck three film prints, which was something we kind of always wanted to do and decided to do and was always in the plan. So I went over to do the DI on, um, on the film itself and then supervised the Prince Big Man. Yeah, so we did, we were in Korea. I mean, the, there's a lot of people that like to say that, like, we did that to hide the movie. So. But your producer, editor, I guess, is from yeah, Korea. Exactly. So that's <laughs> Our post supervisor <laughs> is Korean. And she got us a really great deal because she works over there quite a bit. And so that is, that's the main reason. It was a bonus that. We didn't. I mean, Hollywood is definitely a leaky ship, so yeah. mm-hmm. it was a, it was a bonus that we didn't have to do it at like deluxe or something like that. Yeah. yeah. But that wasn't the primary reason. <laughs> Even though I've heard, I've read in like big news articles, I'm like, oh, really? We did. <laughs> <laughs> so. But it's incredible. I mean, it never got out that you know over that. I mean, there was a long post yeah. period that that it never got out that you were in Disney and you shot any of this and. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what they knew and what they didn't. I've heard various tales that they did know, and that they were at Sundance when we premiered, and yeah, I don't. You know, everybody's got like their own story of everything. Yeah. So I've heard fifty million versions, of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and where they flew in in helicopters to the second screening is the most elaborate one I've heard. Yeah. And so I don't. As far as my knowledge, I've never heard anything from them. I know that's like the official statement from us, mm-hmm. yeah. but I haven't talked to our lawyer in probably five months, so I couldn't <laughs> tell you exactly what. Were you ever afraid at a certain point, like because of whatever copyright issues, maybe the film would never get released or? Yeah, that, that was definitely a fear. Type. That, I mean, that was a thought. That was everyone on everyone's mind the entire time. Um, Randy, to his credit, did a good job of being like, don't, just yeah. drop the issue. Like, you're not going to figure it out. None of us are lawyers. Just <laughs> stop talking about it and focus. And so that's kind of what we did. Yeah. And then I know... And then, you know, I talked to him and he's like, I don't care if we have to go, like, show it in the back of a van for, like, the next five years. We'll just do it. And we're this crazy underground film that you have to see with the guy in a van. And then I was like, okay, like, that's fine with me. <laughs> And uh, as we started getting closer to Sundance, it started, like, did that intensity started going, because it's like, are we going to get our screening or not? And t- up until, like, the night before, where we met this guy at, like, the opening night party, yeah. who had A, seen the movie, because he is, sits on, like, this, this, like, Santa Fe film board or something, and was on their film festival, and then B showed it to all his students. <laughs> we were like, are you kidding me? Like, do you know how many people have been trying to hide this and it's this <laughs> college professor from like New Mexico that blows it up like crazy and stuff. And what was that experience like? You're in Sundance now, I mean, the film is finally finished, uh, that first screening. What yeah. was, how did you gauge everybody's reactions uh, afterwards? Were people like yeah. shocked, like, wow, this is, you're in Disney World, and this is like a... I think people, culture. people didn't understand what they saw at first, because they were just like, how did you guys get permission? And we're like, <laughs> you know, they're like, what is Disney's reaction? I'm like, your guess is as good as mine, in the first Q&A. And so at that point, and then I think there are people, you know, they're like, what's their conspiracy? Like, do they... Yeah know someone at Disney or is Disney really making this movie and so there's like kind of like all this twist and turn and it seemed to take like a couple of hours for him to process it and then like Drew McQueenie like wrote the first review on Hitflix yeah. and after that it was just like 
all the nerves like ended and it was just like excitement from that point because he loved it and then the reviews started like coming up and, and you know reporters started hounding Randy and it just kind of became everything you would hope that independent film at Sundance could be yeah. and so it was after the fear <laughs> it was like the total you know exhilaration and then uh, of course you know, the film got a distribution deal and yeah. it, was, it was out there so yeah, we so our, our sales agency, Synetic, they... Was that John Sloss? Yeah. Yeah. So John Sloss's company, and then he, who's, you know, like our greatest champion of the film, and uh, he's also our attorney. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think he reps like Richard Linkletter, and uh, yeah. like he was involved in Boyhood. And, yeah, I mean, yeah. he's like one of the really huge, kind of unknown to the public figures of independent film. Like, he really... He did Exit Through the Gift Shop, Supersize Me. Like, he's been... His name is on a lot of stuff <laughs> that, you know, people can think of, but, you know, he kind of exists off the chart if you're not in the industry. And so, uh, yeah, he was our lawyer. His company, PDA, distributed the film as well. And they only distribute one film a year. And so the year before they had done Exit to the Gift Shop. So we were really... Yeah. Which also had a Disney yeah. uh, element. Yeah, yeah it was shot a scene there. <laughs> the Abu Ghraib <laughs> protest scene. And so... Yeah, so they distributed us and Film Buff was part of that as well. And uh, Yeah, it was exciting. I mean, I think we opened at like 35 theaters. 20 to 35, I can't remember exactly. And eventually paid like almost 50 so, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was super exciting. Was there a difference between the Sundance cut and what would eventually be sort of the theatrical distribution there cut? Is. So the Sundance cut is 15 minutes longer. It has an intermission in it, which I think is hilarious because it's not a real intermission. Um, so at what's in the intermission now in the movie? I guess there's an additional... Uh, well, the intermission just says intermission now, yeah. right? And then it just goes to like where and it's it goes to the new movie. Yeah. So it's like it's still got kind of the same joke, <laughs> but the old intermission used to be like twice to three times as long. Yeah, and it went reviewed the day because that's kind of where the movie takes a turn to the dark. Uh, kind of as Jim descends into what will eventually be his end. Uh, so in the Sundance cut. He basically like replays the day the way he sees it, <laughs> and there's like these moments where he gives like a big speech to like a crowd, which was a scene in the movie that he fantasized that got cut out because it just didn't work. And so, and there's like all these other scenes that go through, and I I really love the old intermission. And so I know that's like the one thing we all regret losing, but you know, for time you just have to sometimes. And uh, and then there was a lot of just kind of heads and tails of scenes that were just typed up. Yeah. Which probably was where the bulk of the fifteen minutes came from. Um, there was oh, and then there's two legal issues. One was with uh, a brand of triple antibacterial ointment <laughs> that we call Geosport. So we actually used the real brand's name. Uh, and they kind of said we didn't parry it, parry the e it enough. Yeah. Which I so, guess was kind of the legal yeah, exactly. the movie. Everything was sort of under the parody umbrella. Right. So, so it's like a social it. criticism of something. So yeah. we didn't socially criticize Niels Bohr enough because, <laughs> um, yeah, for whatever reason. I don't know if we can even say it. I'm sure we can. It's like news, right? <laughs> Watch we get sued like five years later because I said Neil Sporn in an interview. <laughs> um, and then, so that where there was that, and then the Siemens Corporation. Yeah. The scene with uh, the German scientist was always in the script, but we cut it out. It, it wasn't in the science. Um, Cut. He just kind of sprays the geosport and then gets away. It doesn't. Yeah. The scientist never comes back. But uh, our attorneys felt that because it was essentially run by robots, that it kind of parried it. Or it fell under parody a little, a little better. So. Yeah. 
Uh, so I was going to ask you about uh, Cold Turkey, which uh, came out not too long ago. Uh, so yeah, it's actually a very good amount different. of DVD version yeah, too. So. Yeah, I remember it was on uh, on demand yeah. uh, earlier. But uh, so that's like a completely different dynamic <laughs> from going like guerrilla style till you're in this house and it's you know ensemble of actors, Cheryl Hines. Yeah, the one house. house. So yeah, it was. Uh, <clears throat> it was five D still, right? Yeah, we shot, but that was the five D Mark Three. So yeah, Cold Turkey. Um, it, it's in a lot of ways is very much more of like a homegrown indie film, <laughs> where it's just kind of actors dealing with family issues and kind of real world situation <laughs> um, that we all go through. So I came on the film pretty early. Uh, Will Slocum, his well, she was his girlfriend then. Now he's, she's his wife. She worked with my girlfriend at like Gen Art, so they were. Will was looking to make his second feature, and my name kind of came in the hat, and we hung out, and we. Uh, I signed on really early. The film wasn't cast yet, mm -hmm. so we knew we just wanted to make a little small film, and we kind of agreed that we were going to just do, do it on 5D and have a small amount of crew guys, and but all the lighting we needed, and you know, put our money into production design and lighting and stuff instead of camera. And then, of course, Peter McDonough signed on, like, a couple months later. And then all this huge cast came in, and I think, I don't, maybe financing got bigger, I'm not sure, but that was kind of like the one thing that we kind of held on to, was like, this is still going to be our little <laughs> DSLR movie. And so... Um, yeah. Well, when you're dealing with uh, sort of an intimate piece and it's very much about performance, uh, is it difficult to sort of come up with preconceived shots in a sense, where you're instead yeah. of where you're trying to like focus on what the actors are doing and capture that spontaneous moment? Well, well the way we designed that film was kind of limited. We're limited to one location. I mean, there's a few things that take place outside of the house. Yeah. But for the most part, it's one house. So, and we also didn't want to have like this overly crazy like visual style that kind of overshadowed the acting because that was really what was going to make or break it. So we just really simple like art school 101 concept. The first act of the movie, we tried to shoot like one point perspective. Yeah. For the second half, we tried to shoot two point perspective, and the third act, we tried to shoot three point perspective. So that way, it felt like one location was changing a little bit, and then I th and then at the resolution, we went back to one point or one point perspective for the end of the movie, and so that was kind of like the way we felt we could give a dramatic curve to the photography without doing like major lighting changes or anything super stylized or cons that conceptual it was really basic and yeah. so that was kind of our main visual design plan for that well, it's very uh, well from Cheryl Hines and Peter yeah. Bogdanovich good cast uh, yeah I mean that was an amazing cast uh, working with Sonny Walger was amazing uh, she was on Mind of the Married Man when I was in high school <laughs> which I told her and she's like oh my god I mean and Mike got uh, it. <laughs> or Mike Bint, I can't remember. He wrote, directed that. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. yeah, I can't remember the other guy. But it was like, I loved that show when I was a kid. I mean, I was definitely probably not old enough to watch it. But yeah. uh, so that was kind of a rewarding thing for me to get to work with her because she was someone who was so influential in me when I was like learning a lot about film mm -hmm. and television and yeah. that sort of stuff. So. Uh, do you have any projects coming up? I know Suburban Gothic you mentioned before. Yeah, Suburban Gothic's out. Well, it's not out. It's in the festivals. Uh, just was at Awesome Fest at Chicago. It's LA premieres coming up in October. And I, I'll give you the details on that. Um, I just can't remember them. But yeah, so that's got Matthew Greg Goobler, uh, John Waters, and Captain Innings is in it. 
She's actually the lead. John Waters, John Waters is, is acting. Uh, yeah, he's a small part of it. Him and Ricky are good buddies. <laughs> and so, actually, I think he's like Ricky's hero and somehow lucked out and got him in his first movie, Excision. And so, um, John Waters came back to play a small part in this movie again. So, <laughs> He, uh, yeah, and he's a really cool guy, too. So that movie is opening. Or it's not opening. It's in festivals. And then I'm going to start shooting a movie next month called Blackout. Um, Zoe Ward is directing that movie. Cool. And she did Zoe and Chloe, which was a web series. And so that, this is her first feature, I'm pretty sure. So it's a great script and really interesting. I don't think they're cast yet, but... Yeah. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, and then the last thing I was going to ask, uh, are there any uh, sort of tips or advice that you have for cinematographers in terms of like, uh, you know, what they should look out for when they're working? Um, let me see. What's a good cinematography tip? You know, I, someone, I can't remember who it was. It was at AFI, we had like a cinematographer tell us that like, you know, amateurs worry about cameras and equipment. Yeah. You know, journeymen worry about budget and masters worry about story and composition. So that's what I would say to put your focus on. And like, it doesn't, I always, I think cold turkey for me is a good example of you can do, you can make a $4,000 camera look good and it can go on big screens and hold up and I've seen other films that are shot on 70s and 5Ds that blow out half the stuff I've seen shot on red by people who don't know what they're doing. And so, you know, I would focus on your storytelling and you and what you're doing. And, you know, take that extra second when you're setting up a shot, when everyone's pushing you and it's crazy and it's busy, and take that extra, even if it's 30 seconds, and just look at the shot and make sure you know, run down the checklist. Are you telling a story? Could it be better if I moved up or down or left, right? Does it do this a little more? Does it do that? And yeah. if you do that, I think you'll always be successful.